Thanks. Good. Thank you, Simone. And, and uh, thanks, everyone, for uh, joining um, the talk. It's my pleasure to be here. And, um, uh, and thank you for the organizers uh, for uh, putting together a fantastic program and also um, inviting me to, um, to give a talk about some of the work that, um, uh, that I've been doing. So the title of, um, of the talk, of course, is um, a bit ambitious. Um, it talks about foundations for fair algorithmic decision making. And in preparing this talk, I've been um, what I've been thinking. I, I thought quite a bit about what aspects of this broad space or broad uh, research area to focus on. And I was looking through uh, some of the uh, other uh, scheduled talks, and I felt that rather than attempt to um, give a very broad overview of all the different types of works that are going on in the space. Um, or um, even go too deep into a single or a set of methods, what I thought I would do instead is just um, structure the talk around some lessons uh, that I learned working in this field over the last few years. These are, um, so um, at different points in the talk, I'm going to have takeaways. In fact, um, the talk has three main takeaways. Um, and these are things that I wish that I understood um, when I started working in this area about four to five years ago. Um, but uh, hopefully, uh, these, some of these takeaways would be useful for you as well. So let me get started. So we're going to talk about algorithmic decision making today. And what I mean by this is effectively data-driven decision making. This is one where you're learning over data from the past decision outcomes, and um, you are using um, uh, you're using past history uh, to uh, predict uh, future outcomes. And this sort of decision making is increasingly influencing every aspect of our life. Um, you can think of search recommender and reputation algorithms on sites like Google or Facebook or Twitter or YouTube, where these algorithms are increasingly moderating the social discourse that we have. Uh, influencing the types of opinion we hold, um, influencing who we meet, what sort of news we are exposed to, what sort of job opportunities we are exposed to, and so on. Then there are match and uh, market making algorithms on gig economy platforms and a number of platforms like Uber, Lyft, or Kickstarter, where essentially you have algorithms um, connecting people um, with with goods and services. Um, like um, you have on Uber, you have algorithms matching riders to drivers. Um, on Airbnb, you have algorithms matching travelers to hosts. Um, and on Kickstarter, you have algorithms matching um, entrepreneurs with uh, venture capitalists. Um, and then finally, there is another class of risk prediction algorithms that are increasingly becoming popular, um, whether this is in predictive policing, where algorithms are being used to predict where a crime might happen next or which um, children are likely to injure themselves or which employees might leave um, your organization. Or, uh, uh, and finally, there is the uh, well-known uh, case of uh, assessment of risk for people defaulting on loans and so on. Now, given the impact these algorithms are having on our everyday lives, it's only natural that um, there are a number of concerns that are being raised about their fairness. Um, I'm, let me just list out a, a few. For example, there is a concern about discrimination in predictive risk analytics. What I'm showing here is the headline of an article that appeared a few years ago um, titled Machine Bias, and it says that there is a software used across the country to predict future criminals and is biased against blacks, and the country here being the US. Um, I'm going to, we're going to talk um, a lot more about this particular uh, aspect um, later on in the talk, but it's beyond discrimination. There are also concerns about the opacity of the algorithmic decision making. You have um, really interesting uh, books with the titles like Weapons of Math Destruction and the Black Box Society um, that actually talk about how very few people actually understand what um, data um, is being gathered about them and how this data is being used in making these uh, decisions that affect their day-to-day -day lives. And finally, you have um, many concerns about implicit biases in search and recommender systems. And the example I'm showing here is an article in New York Times about 
um, whether YouTube uh, recommendation system is likely to drive audience towards um, videos that expose um, more extreme views. Now, given these, these concerns about, um, about fairness of algorithmic decision making, um, and given the broad set of things fairness can, can cover, um, I thought I would focus, um, I, I we'll get started by talking about um, one specific um, lesson that I wish I knew um, before I started working in the space. Uh, and let me actually be a little provocative and say that one of the root causes of ethical issues in algorithms is because um, many computer scientists designing these algorithms have a fetish for utilitarianism. Um, now, let me explain um, what utilitarianism is through an example, and then we'll um, and then I'll try to convince you that I'll, uh, that many computer scientists today um, think in a very utilitarian way. Now, to understand this, um, let's start with a thought experiment. This is a very well-known thought experiment um, that has been posed uh, and discussed by philosophers for a very long period of time, and it is uh, the trolley um, uh, problem. So imagine you have an out-of-control trolley that is um, rolling down the, tr the train tracks, um, and um, you, have, you have a bunch of five people who are tied down um, to the train tracks, and you are the person who is controlling the lever um, and if you pull the lever, the trolley can be diverted um, from, the, uh, from the main track to a side track. But then the issue is that you have another person that is tied to the side track. Now, the question is, if you were the person who is controlling the lever, how many of you would pull the lever? Now, I wish this was a physical uh, lecture uh, in the same hall, that, that we were all in the same hall, then I could have easily asked you to raise your hands. But um, um, this sort of an, uh, thought experiment, um, I, I mean, multiple people have taken surveys of, of these sorts of things. And it turns out that, that the answers are not always very clear. There are some people who feel comfortable pulling the lever, and there are also um, uh, people who would say that they wouldn't pull the lever. Um, now, let's think of another situation or scenario that would change this. The change in this change scenario, once again, you have a trolley that is out of control running down the train tracks. And if you did nothing, it will kill five people. Uh, and you're the person and, um, who is standing on the bridge. And there is also a fat man who is standing on the bridge. And you have the option of pushing the fat man onto the train tracks and stopping the train. Okay. Now, we can once again ask the question, how many of you would push the fat man? Now. It turns out that compared to the previous situation, um, far fewer people would consider pushing the fat man onto the train tracks. Now, at this point, you could ask the question, what's the difference? Now, an utilitarian might say, well, in both cases, the outcomes are, the, are, are quite similar. You're saving five people uh, if you pull the lever um, and in the process, you're costing the life of one person. And if you look, if you think about it purely from the perspective of, of outcomes or the consequences of your action, it's the same even here. But very clearly, people feel very differently. It seems that there is something more involved than just thinking about the outcomes. And that's the point that I'm trying to communicate. Utilitarianism is often thinking about just the final consequences. Now, to drive home this point further, Let's think of the final thought experiment. Suppose you're a doctor um, treating uh, five patients, and let's say each of them needs a different um, organ um, to survive. Now, you have a healthy person who is brought in to the hospital. Would any of you consider harvesting the organs of the healthy person to save five people? In this particular case, um, I hope nobody would, because that would be extremely unethical. But once again, if you were to think of it purely from the perspective of outcomes of life saved versus lives it costs, all the three scenarios are actually more or less identical. But there is a clear difference because of the context. Now, let me actually now formally uh, come to formally defining what utilitarianism is about. Um, utilitarianism is one where you try to decide the righteousness of a decision system 
purely based on its consequences. And actually, it's much more narrower than that. You, if you try to decide whether an action or whether a decision is right based on how well it maximizes the sum of utilities of outcomes for each individual in the population, that is what utilitarianism is about. Now, let me explain, um, emphasize this thing. So what you look at is the outcomes for each individual. You're not, you're, you're taking the population, you're looking at the outcomes for each individual in the population, and then you define some utility function for that outcomes. And then you try to sum up the utilities of outcomes for each individual in the population. If you did that and you, and you thought that maximizing the utility function for individual outcomes in the population is the, is the right way to go, then you are a utilitarian. Now, let me, uh, let me try to argue that computer scientists have a fetish for utilitarianism. To understand this, let's look at the objectives of learning models um, in any machine learning class. Um, you would probably learn that one of the ways in which you do learning is you try to find some sort of an optimal boundary um, after you define um, some sort of a loss function. So um, you take a population um, of people or users, and then in any typical machine learning uh, model, what you do is you try to capture, um, you try to define a loss function that captures the error or inaccuracy in individual predictions. And then you try to minimize the error that is maximize the utility or the, uh, or the accuracy over all examples in the training data. So it's, if you look at pretty much any learning model, you have this, this sort of a form. You try to uh, minimize the loss um, where loss is defined as sum over I to N, where there are N examples in the training data, and then you have a loss function. Now, now here I'm showing a, a least squared loss function, but you can have a variety of different loss functions for different learning models. But fundamentally, every all the traditional learning models try to optimize the sum of um, uh, individual, uh, sum of errors for individuals in the population. So in the process, we are often extreme utilitarians. Now, this is also the root cause of discrimination. The reason is utilitarianism focuses on minimizing the overall prediction errors. But in the process, it ignores inequality at the group level. Um, and so as a result, you can well end up ha having a situation where you are making decisions that are that would be considered quite discriminatory because utilitarianism doesn't consider itself with group level error rates and its and the, uh, utilities are always defined at the individual error rates uh, individual level now to just illustrate this further let's take a, another example another thought experiment so imagine we are having to decide or we are having to pick between three different decision systems system 1 system 2 and system 3 now, what I'm showing here in this table is the accuracy of system one for men and women. Let's assume a population where you have equal numbers of men and women um, that are being subjected to the decision system. And he, you have the accuracies of um, accuracies for um, all the three systems. Uh, so the first system uh, has accuracy of 100% for men, 50% for women. So the overall accuracy is 75 and so on, right? Now, the question is, if you had a choice um, to pick one of the three decision systems, for some task, let's say the task is about um, uh, predicting or, or deciding who to give loans to, um, which decision system would you pick if you had the option of these three? Now, if you were a pure utilitarian, you would pick system one because you would say, well, the overall accuracy is, is the highest for it. That's what you're going to pick. If you're someone who cared about perfect equality, you might pick system three because you would say, this is the only system out of the three that is equally accurate for both for both groups. Now, somebody might make another argument um, for system two. For example, there could be two different types of arguments for system two. Somebody might say, well, system two offers a sort of a trade-off between um, overall accuracy and, um, and inequality in the group error rates. So somebody might argue that this might offer a better trade-off. And now they're putting some amount of weight on the overall accuracy and some amount of weight in equality or inequality um, between the, between the, in the error rates for the two groups or the accuracies for the two groups. 
Now, there could be another argument that somebody might make for system two, which is that if you compare system two and system three, system two is better than system three for both men and women. So somebody might say, well, system two Pareto dominates system three. So you should always pick system two over system three. And therefore, even if you cared about equality, you would go with system two. So as you notice, there could be a lot of very nuanced arguments for why we, are, we might pick different decision systems once you're willing to let go of the obsession with maximizing the overall error rate in your predictions. And that's the point that I wanted to communicate. So the first takeaway um, is not to rely exclusively on utilitarianism when you're designing and evaluating algorithms. And that's the point that I wanted to make. Um, and that ends the first takeaway. Um, I'm happy to take um, a couple of questions, if there are any, um, at this stage before I move on. If you have a question, feel free to type it in or feel free to uh, turn on your microphone and ask. Uh, they can't, but they can um, raise their hands. It looks like Simone has a question. Simone, you can uh, unmute yourself and go ahead and ask. Um, yes, I, I have a question actually, uh, because I was thinking that um, usually uh, when trying to implement fairness in uh, algorithms, what we actually do is to change the objective function. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, we are using once again an utilitarian strategy for countering utility utilitarianism so i i, I was yes. uh, just uh, asking whether you have uh, an idea on that so Thank you. you're you're actually um that's a great question so when you add an objective like for example suppose you said um i want to maximize um my overall accurate accuracy for the overall population subject to some constraints on inequality in the group error rate. So suppose that was your objective function. You're no longer utilitarian. Because keep in mind that utilitarianism is an extreme form where you say the only thing that you're going to willing to consider is individual outcomes. And you want to maximize the sum of utilities for individual outcomes. But the moment you bring in any sort of a group level utility, um, which is what you would be doing if you said, uh, in your optimization problem, you changed the objectives and added equality, you added a constraint on equalizing group error rates, then all of a sudden, um, you're no longer a utilitarian because you, you've changed the objective. So in that sense, utilitarianism is, is sort of like a, a very, very extreme form um, of, um, uh, of uh, or, or a very, very limited form of objectives. So in that sense, it's not a contradiction. Thank you very much. Utilitarianism is not just about any time you define a utility. That's not utilitarianism. Utilitarianism is much more. It's not just about util utilities. It's about defining utilities at the level of individuals and then insisting that the only rightiest thing to do is to maximize the sum of the utilities. Yeah. Good. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Now, at this point, let me move on. Um, so. Okay. So. We said that um, uh, algorithmic designers should look for something beyond utilitarian um, objectives. But then the natural question that would come up is, okay, how should algorithm, algorithm designers select these criteria? Um, because in some sense, at least utilitarianism for all its flaws is, is, is a very natural, intuitive thing to think about. But if you're saying that it has to be beyond utilitarian objectives, so who gives the other objectives? How should we decide this? Um, and how do we search for the right normative criteria? Normative criteria are the things that, that we should be going for. Um, now, one of the things that I would argue is that this is actually not the job of algorithm designers. Our job, I'm now speaking as a computer scientist, I'm a computer scientist and I, uh, and I am not an, um, uh, an ethics person. I, I do interact with social scientists and I'm, and I'm fascinated by the conversations and I try to learn them. So I'm going to speak more from the perspective of a computer scientist. So I feel like our job is to operationalize a given normative criteria. Um, that is, 
And what I mean by operationalization, and I'm going to um, emphasize this quite a bit, is how do you make um, a normative criteria that is defined by philosophers or the society or the legal scholars, how do you, which is often in a natural language like um, German or English or whatever it is, um, how do you make them formally measurable in terms of empirical observations? How do you do this formal translation of a, um, of a ethical principle? And this is what I'm calling as operationalization. Now, to understand this, let, let's be concrete. Let's try to, um, in the rest of the talk, I'm going to focus on operationalizing discrimination. Now, discrimination, keep in mind, is a very, very specific type of unfairness. It doesn't cover a lot of, um, uh, it, it doesn't cover all unfairness. Um, it's been well studied in social sciences, political science, moral philosophy, economics, and law. Majority of the countries have anti-discrimination laws, and discrimination is also recognized in several international human rights law. So our goal here or today is to operationalize discrimination, that is to study discrimination from a computational perspective. Now, the work that I'm going to present is by itself not, um, it, it's, it's a few years, um, uh, I mean, people have worked on discrimination for the last uh, several years, including us. And I'm going to use this one um, as, a, as a way to communicate some higher level takeaways um, and uh, towards the end. Now, so to start with, let's, since it has been well studied in social sciences, let's pick a definition of discrimination that is actually used um, in social sciences. So here I'm, I'm actually presenting a definition that I picked from Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. And it's sort of like a moralized or a normative definition. And what it says is discrimination is wrongfully imposing a relative disadvantage on persons based on their membership in some salient social group. Now, hopefully most of you would, uh, would relate to this definition and you would say like, okay, this seems like a reasonable definition. But of course, the challenge is how do we operationalize the definitions? How do we make an algorithm um, distinguish, measure, and understand whether or not discrimination is going on in a given data set of decisions um, that is given a set of empirical observations? That's the challenge. Now, to do that, we need to, um, need to operationalize four fuzzy notions. These are the ones that I highlighted in, in the definition, which is what constitutes a relative disadvantage? What constitutes a wrongful imposition? What constitutes based on? What constitutes a salient social group? Because these are phrases that are used in the definition. How do we operationalize them? So let's start with um, maybe the easiest one, which is uh, what constitutes a salient social group? Um, because oftentimes the anti-discrimination laws um, that are defined by the society and by, the, by some legislatures often actually precisely identify which group it is for a given context. So, for example, um, if you're talking about uh, housing allocation or if you're talking about employment opportunities, there are some well-defined groups that are declared by legal scholars, by the laws of the, of the nations that we are part of, as uh, protected. And so this is something that we don't have to, um, to worry about. So they, they define and societies over time sometimes add more and more protected groups. For example, sexual orientation was not a protected group a um, long time ago, like 30, 40 years ago in, in many countries, but now they are in, in many different anti-discrimination laws. So we as algorithmic designers are, are, can take those protected groups um, and we don't have to... to, to worry too much about at least that specific part. But what about the other things? So to understand how to operationalize the other phrases, let me take a case study. And this is um, the famous uh, case study of the COMPAS recidivism risk prediction tool. Presumably many of you would have already heard about this several times. So I'm going to go over this a, a, just a little bit quickly. So COMPAS is a recidivism risk prediction tool and it's built by a commercial company called Northpoint. Um, and what Compass does is it estimates the likelihood uh, or the probability of criminals reoffending in the future. Um, and as inputs, it takes the answers the defendants give to a very long questionnaire. And the outputs are essentially risk scores um, for the defendants, which are then made accessible to judges and parole officers in the US in several jurisdictions um, to make um, as they make their decisions. Now, Compass has been trained over big data, 
um, that is, they gathered historical recidivism data about uh, of people who have been let go on parole across the US. And when training the tool, um, they deliberately excluded sensitive feature information like race because they did not want it um, to be um, to be discriminatory. In some sense, by excluding the race, um, they were hoping to actually achieve um, some sort of reformation of the criminal justice system. In fact, the designers of the tool had very noble goals. Um, they observed that many studies show that when human judges make decisions, um, they are often exhibit racial biases. Um, and the big idea of Compass was that if only you can, we can nudge the subjective human decision makers with objective algorithmic predictions, we would hopefully make the whole system better. Now, behind this idea are some very important assumptions. The first is that algorithms have no pre-existing biases, unlike humans, seems intuitive. And the other thing is that algorithms would actually process the information always in a consistent manner. Um, for example, there have been studies that showed that judges make decisions very differently before lunch when they are hungry and after lunch when, they are, when their stomachs are full and they're, they're probably uh, feeling better. Whereas algorithms, on the other hand, um, will give you the same decisions no matter at what point of time you give the inputs. And so the big idea was that if only we can train algorithms to make accurate predictions without race information, then essentially, if you have a black defendant and a white defendant with the same features, then they would get exactly the same outcome. And this, they thought, would lead to equality of treatment or no disparity or no inequality in treatment, and therefore would be non-discriminatory, which seems to make a lot of sense. And in some sense, if we went back to our operationalization of core fuzzy notions, um, essentially what Compass did is it defined based on as using salient group information in training or deployment. So if you avoid using group information in training or deployment, then essentially it cannot be based on. Any decision is not based on, and therefore you're going to do good. And that's the, that's the reasoning that they used. Whether they recognized it or not is a different thing, but that's the, fun, that's the way they were, they were thinking about the design of the tool. Now, the, uh, the argument seemed quite compelling. And in fact, this is what led to um, a, 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 um, a somewhat um, widespread uh, use of Compass um, in various uh, jurisdictions in the US. And at some point, a, few, a, a year or two down the road, um, a, a investigative journalism organization called ProPublica actually wanted to check whether Compass is actually non-discriminatory. And to do this, what they did was they gathered some data from um, Broward County in Florida, and then they looked at um, the, the error rates um, for black defendants and white defendants as predicted by Compass. Uh, now, Compass gives a risk score, and um, here to achieve, to get these numbers, um, they grouped um, the, some of the risk scores into um, high risk and, and low risk. So essentially what you see here are two different tables um, separating out the risk scores for, um, uh, or the, uh, this is sort of like the, uh, the confusion matrix for black defendants and white defendants. And, oops, and the top row shows the data for people who actually recidivated in, in the real world. Um, this, uh, and the bottom row shows the data for people who stayed clean and did not recidivate. And the columns show the high risk and the low risk. So the numbers in the green are the ones for which Compass got the accurate um, predictions, and the numbers in the red are the ones for which Compass got the wrong predictions. Now, using this confusion uh, matrix, they, ProPublica simply computed the false positive rates for black defendants and white defendants, and the false negative rates for the black defendants and the white defendants. And what they showed was that the false positive and false negative rates are considerably worse for blacks than for whites. So if you look at the numbers, the false positive rate for blacks is twice as high as that of whites, which is bad. And the false negative rate, which means you're give, being given a benefit of doubt, um, is actually half that of white defendants, which is once again, bad for black defendants. And this is what leads to inequality in error rates. 
essentially that's what they observed and this they claimed was discriminatory and this is the basis of that article headline that i showed before about machine bias that there is a software that is um, being used to predict future criminals that is biased against blacks now once again let's try to put um, what propublica investigated into our big thing of operationalizing four fuzzy notions now what propublica did was it operationalized relative disadvantage in terms of group error rates so what it is saying is in their analysis what they effectively did was they said let's look at the group error rates like false positive false negative you could discover you could also add other rates overall error rates false discovery rates false omission rates so you take some measure of group error rate and let's look at inequality in the group error rates and what constitutes a relative disadvantage whenever there is a disparity in group error rates right that's the way they, they did it now notice that the question of course that confused people um, at the time when the article came out um, was who is right because <clears throat> it just it just so happened that previously compass made an argument that they're being um, that because they excluded race information they're being non-discriminatory and now all of a sudden you see an analysis that is that that says that there is discrimination so who is right and what is going on here how is it possible that once you remove the race information that you still have this disparity in error rates where is this coming from now in some sense the to think more a bit more formally what we are asking is are we sure if if you removed race information which is the which is a different which is based on which is operationalizing based on are you sure that you would get <clears throat> equality in error rates now the moment you see it this way you start recognizing that these are two different operationalizations and there is no reason why one should lead to another or vice versa in fact let me give you clear intuition for why one doesn't imply the other <clears throat> to understand this <clears throat> let's look at how compass learns who recidivates now what i'm showing here is just a um, a um, an illustration um, let's say the defendants have two features um, along the x and y axis. The ticks are the, are the defendants um, that um, did not recidivate, um, that stayed clean, and the crosses are the defendants that uh, recidivated. Now, Compass uses historical data like this with, the, with, with ground truth labels, and what it's trying to do is it's trying to find the most optimal um, boundary, um, let's say linear boundary, um, to separate the two classes. Now I'm using here a linear boundary is just a straight line, but you, in, in fact, it could, um, the observations that I'm going to make would up equally apply for nonlinear boundaries as well. And let's say compass was fine, was fine to find this um, most optimal linear boundary um, by doing some sort of a minimization of some least square loss um, function, let's say. Um, so clearly, uh, there are infinite number of linear boundaries that that you can draw in on over this uh, over this over the space and uh, compass is trying to find the best one um, that separates the two classes that is the ticks from the crosses by doing optimizing some form of function like this now let's observe the linear boundary which seems to be doing a pretty good job here um, now what i'm going to do is reveal um, the information related to race of these defendants let's say there are these defendants actually now belong to two different races the yellows and the blues right now notice that all of a sudden the most accurate linear boundary seems to be performing very differently for the yellow group compared to the blue group um, in fact if you look at it um, it makes first of all very few errors for the yellow and it makes a lot more errors for blue. Furthermore, the types of errors that it makes are also quite different. For yellow, a, a, a cross is being treated as a tick, and for blues, many ticks are being treated as crosses. So this is what leads to inequality in error rates. And in some sense, what happened shouldn't be surprising at all because the goal of Compass, um, without using the protected attribute information in training was to maximize the uh, the accuracy for the entire population 
And in the process, it's quite possible that you would actually end up having very different um, error rates for the two different groups. In some sense, the cause of error rate disparity is to minimize the overall errors. Classifiers are minimizing individual level errors. That is, you're trying to minimize um, the predicted, um, uh, the, you're, you're trying to minimize the probability that the predicted outcome is not the same as a true outcome for everyone in the population. Uh, and, um, and to do this, oftentimes you're using some sort of a proxy loss function um, to achieve this objective. But this clearly doesn't guarantee um, equal average group level errors because equalizing um, overall error uh, uh, overall error rate does not guarantee um, equalizing group level overall error rates like this or this, which is false positive rate, or this, which is false negative rate. I'm just showing in just a little bit more formal way um, using probabilities notation um, for the equalizing of the error rates. Achieving targeting this objective clearly does not guarantee achieving any of the objectives um, lower down, right? Now, of course, at this point, we could ask the question, could Compass have, have trained, could Compass be trained in a different way um, to avoid discrimination? Well, first of all, it depends on the definition of discrimination, but suppose if you, if your goal was to equalize the group level error rates, then we could, we could present them or we could specify those things as learning constraints because that's the most natural thing. Um, and you want to optimize for accuracy under those constraints. So what I mean is rather than using the traditional objective of minimizing the overall um, error rate, which is this, you could simply say, let's try to minimize the overall error rate subject to the constraint that the error rates for the two different groups, um, in this particular case, black and white dependents should be the same. You could do this. Now, in some sense, what is happening here is that these constraints are embedding ethics or values when you're learning. Now, <clears throat> there is an important point though, which is that there is no free lunch, which is when you add these additional constraints, um, the overall accuracy that you might achieve is going to be lower than the overall accuracy that would be achieved if you didn't have the constraint. And so you are going to essentially have a little bit of a trade-off between the different types of ethical objectives that you would want to go for. Notice that max, uh, the minimizing the overall error rate is also a perfectly fine goal, just as is um, limiting the inequality in the error rates between the different groups. And also another important thing is you need race information in the training um, data to avoid this sort of disparate mistreatment. <clears throat> what I mean by that is if you wanted to solve this optimization problem, notice that the constraint requires information about race, which means that whole idea of stripping out or removing race information in the training data actually prevents you from training or achieving this sort of an objective. So now let's see, let's put this back in this, in this picture of operationalizing discrimination. So essentially, if you want to achieve equality in group error rates, you have to change your definition of what based on is. So you might still want to have, um, you might still um, not want to have race be used as in your decision function, which means you might still not want to use race in deployment. That means race should not be used in the final function. But if you want to achieve equality of group error rates, you would still need it in the training time, during the training time. Notice how subtle these things are now becoming to achieve group error rates um, and to satisfy. Um, and if you didn't want the final decision to be to have race as an as an explicit feature that is used, um, the, you could still use race information during training, but avoid using it in deployment um, because um, that is something that is doable. So let's come to the technical challenge. Of course, the technical challenge then is how do you learn efficiently under these, these constraints? So we now changed the optimization problem. Now, how do we solve this, um, this new optimization problem? Now, the basic idea or the basic issue is that the above formulations are not convex. You cannot learn efficiently. In fact, 
this is precisely why um, oftentimes in, in standard machine learning, you find some sort of a proxy function, um, a convex proxy function, um, convex loss as a proxy function, because usually when you have um, a convex function, it's often easy to optimize for. Um, so, of course, these days um, you, you have non-convex optimizations as well, um, but in general, um, traditionally in machine learning, um, oftentimes if you can find a nice convex proxy for an objective, that's good. Uh, and this is why you have this least squared loss um, as a proxy um, for maximizing the overall accuracy or minimizing the overall error rate. And the question now is, can we have uh, proxies for these constraints as well, which are now written in, um, in terms of probability? So the, the question is, how do we rewrite the constraints? Well, let's, let's think about this. And the basic idea in, in some sense is, um, is, is the standard trick that is often used um, in, in machine learning, which is um, instead of um, defining, um, it, it is to rewrite the constraints as um, in terms of the distance from the decision boundary. So the idea is instead of insisting that the misclassification probabilities for both groups or uh, be the same, what we can say is how about um, trying to make sure that the average misclassification distance from the boundary for both groups be the same. And what we mean by this is you take all the points that are misclassified and you look at their distance from the decision boundary and you try to make this make the average distance of these misclassified points from the decision boundary for the two groups be the same. So in some sense, the reason why we go for the misclassification distance, and this is the standard trick in machine learning, is because that distance metric can be expressed in a formulation like this, which is concave, um, which enables us to rewrite um, the misclassification constraints um, like this, and what I'm showing here is essentially one of them is a proxy for um, the error rate for um, uh, one group of defendants, and the other is um, a proxy for the error rate um, for, the, for another group. And then essentially what this constraint is saying here is the difference between the two error rates should be bounded between a minus epsilon and a plus epsilon. That means you're, you're essentially basically bounding the absolute value of the of the difference between the error rates. And that's the basic idea. Now, by rewriting the constraints this way, essentially what we have, um, what we now have, this optimization problem is now a convex concave um, optimization problem. And the good news is there are some efficient solutions um, for this already that have been proposed by um, Boyd at all. And we can just use them to solve this. Now, the question is, of course, do these constraints work? Um, let me just uh, present one high level uh, result from this. So we applied these constraints um, over a uh, data set um, that was gathered by ProPublica in the Broward County. It, it, the data set had a number of features and the class label that we're trying to predict is a two year recidivism rate. And if you trained traditional classifiers, like whether it is SVM or, or, or logistic regression or linear regression or whatever, um, usually there is um, a significant dif difference in the error rate. So for example, um, the accuracy that we got is, um, is about 67% um, and the false positive rate disparity is 20 percentage points um, and, and uh, the false negative rate inequality or disparity is 30 percentage points. Now, when we train the same classifiers, whether it is SVM or logistic regression or linear regression with the constraints, we saw a minimal drop in accuracy from 67 to 66, but in terms of the drop in disparity, um, it's, be, it's a lot more. And um, it went down from 20 to three and 30 to 11. Now, a couple of quick comments. And uh, the first thing is the drop in accuracy is a little flattering, um, but there is no theoretical guarantee that the drop would be uh, as small as what we saw here. It, in some sense, I would, in, in, in fact, I would even say we might have gotten lucky on a different data set, the drop could be significantly more. Um, and the second thing um, is um, that we weren't able to um, completely eliminate the disparity. Um, this was the best that we could do as we tightened the constraints um, um, to a smaller and smaller value. Um, now, uh, now, in practice, um, in fact, it might even be completely impossible 
to achieve perfect um, equality in these error rates. In fact, there are some impossibility results showing that under certain conditions, um, these sorts of things might be impossible. So this brings me to the takeaway too, to what I described so far, which is um, there are three basic challenges whenever you're operationalizing some normative criteria, um, which is what you would have to do when you're doing, um, when you're operationalizing ethical machine learning. And the three challenges are um, operationalization, which is how do you formally interpret fairness principles in different algorithmic decision-making scenarios. The second challenge would be of synthesis. That is, how do you design efficient learning mechanisms for different fairness interpretations? So what I walked you through is, um, the first thing is I was showing what the different fuzzy notions could be um, operationalized as. That is, how, do we, how can we formally interpret them? And then we just saw a challenge of how do you design efficient learning mechanisms? How do you find these uh, different, um, how, do you, how do you rewrite some of the, um, the objectives um, so that you can actually efficiently learn? And then there is also an analysis part, which is what are the trade-offs between the different learning objectives? And this is also something that we just saw, which is if you tried um, to, um, to, to, if you add some constraints, um, achieving for one objective, you would, you would have to give up certain things on the other um, objectives of your ethical learning. Now, very quickly, what we talked was, in some sense, two operationalizations. Um, and then the question is, are they sufficient for all scenarios? Are we done? Um, and the answer is actually no. Um, it turns out that um, when, you're, when you're thinking about all the possible scenarios, there may be different operationalizations that are needed in other situations. So for example, so far, I never even mentioned this, but I assumed that the training data labels were unbiased. So we always assumed that um, the big data, that the, the big historical recidivism data that Compax um, uh, gathered is unbiased. But everybody knows that the data was based on people who were let go on parole in the previous years. And the parole decisions were made by judges, human judges who were known to be biased, which means that the original data that you're starting with itself, there is good reasons to believe would be biased. But if your original data was biased, what does it mean to optimize for prediction accuracy over a potentially biased data set? That raises all sorts of tricky questions. And so sometimes uh, you might want to use a different operationalization. That means you might, you might want to say, if you're training, if you suspect that your training data is biased, you may not want to require equal um, group error rates um, because error rates are, are, are with respect to, uh, when you're trying to equalize group error rates, you're assuming that, that the training data is unbiased. So maybe you would want to go for a different one, which is equalizing group acceptance rates. Uh, and what I mean by acceptance rate is the fraction of people who get the positive outcome. That is in the case of, um, in, in the case of uh, risk prediction, the fraction of people who might get um, one or the other. Now you might say that this is not the right objective in, in the case of uh, criminal recidivism risk prediction, but it might be the right objective in a different situation um, when you suspect that your training data is biased. Maybe in the case of um, employment um, and, and people's performance on jobs, maybe. Then, um, as I, uh, then sometimes you could end up being in a situation where requiring parity, that means requiring equality, equal error rates for all groups can lead to every group being worse off. Um, and in fact, um, I, I showed an example of this in this, in this thought experiment with um, early on, where we talked about three different decision systems, where um, a decision system two um, was actually better off for both men and women um, compared to decision system um, three, right? So sometimes actually requiring equality of error rates might lead to a situation where both groups get worse results. In, in those sorts of situations, um, you, could have, um, you could have a different operationalization where you say, look, try to go for, uh, uh, try to achieve equal error rates. But if you had a situation where you could improve the performance for both groups, even if, the, if it were unequal, in those situations, just go for whatever is, is the Pareto optimal boundary. Now, once again, this is a different operationalization of the 
of the things. And of course, the, you can actually formally write out constraints and, and define objectives and solve for them. And this is what we did in, in, in Europe's paper several years ago. Um, and then finally, some of you might be wondering, well, if your goal is to do the best job you can, why not just use the group information um, when you specify the decision boundaries? And now this might well be a, a reasonable thing to do in certain situations. So for example, if you're doing medical diagnosis, maybe you would want to explicitly account for race and gender or sex information when you're making those, those decisions. Um, but in other situations, you might not want to. Um, now, even there, we, uh, when we were thinking about it, um, we, we hit upon an interesting situation. Now, let's ask ourselves, what is it that might make people, uh, that, that would give people a pause when they're considering and uh, using the group information when making decisions like um, recidivism risk prediction or even employment kind of decisions? The feeling often is that there may be reverse discrimination. And what I mean by that is the intuition seems to be that sometimes if you use group information, that one group somehow has it easy than the other group. The one group's boundary is or, or, or threshold is somehow lower. But, the, but sometimes in your data set, you might have a situation where you have two different boundaries for two different groups that are actually not clearly one being lower than the other. That is, you could actually have two different boundaries um, where um, the decision boundary one works better for group one, but not for group two, and decision boundary two works better for um, group two, but not group one. And in which case, if you actually gave the choice for both groups to pick whichever boundaries they wanted, they might actually pick two separate boundaries. And these are something that can be formalized as envy-free boundaries. And once again, this is a different form of operationalization that can be enabled. Um, now, to summarize, if you were to think about operationalizing discrimination, um, and we started off by saying there are four fuzzy notions that we need to operationalize. And here is the final list that we ended up with after we did some work in this space. Um, and essentially, you can have a, a you can, depending on how you pick a salient social group, which, which notion of based on you're picking and which notion of relative disadvantage you're picking and which notion of wrongful imposition you're picking, you could have a combination of different sets of objectives. And this is all something that is possible. So as you can see, my, my, I guess my, um, at this point you might, you might wonder, and in fact, um, uh, others wondered as well, aren't these too many interpretations? Aren't these like way too many um, things, too many fairness definitions? And uh, by the way, we're only talking about discrimination. We even, and which is just one subset of all types of fairness or, or all types of unfairness. Um, aren't these too many interpretations? Many people wonder about that. Yes, but they're needed in different contexts. Um, at the end of the day, we're talking about using these algorithms in a variety of societal contexts. And in fact, um, given the wide variety of context we have, I would even say having just, I don't know, on the previous page, if you, could, if you could add up all the combinations of them, maybe there are like 24 or 36 of them, it's just too small, in fact, rather than being too large. And when operationalizing, algorithmic designers, I feel, should maintain informed neutrality between reasonable ethical positions. And what I mean by informed neutrality is, it's not up to me, as algorithmic designer to say which interpretation should be used in which context. Oftentimes we see, um, uh, I see particularly in, amongst computer scientists, these sorts of debates about, well, I think um, this envy freeness is bad or Pareto optimality is bad. And oftentimes what they actually mean is apply, applying that notion in a particular context is bad, but there may be another context in which the same notion might actually make a lot of sense. And so as algorithmic designers, I think we have, I feel that we have the obligation to, to design these algorithms and solve these optimization problems, the synthesis and the analysis part for a variety of different um, interpretations that could be reasonably used in some, some context. 
And that's what I mean by maintaining informed neutrality. And designers should not attempt to resolve which position is better. Um, and so the takeaway here is to study the connection between the algorithmic designs and their consequences um, while maintaining informed neutrality between reasonable ethical positions. Now, this particular formulation of this takeaway is something that I actually um, uh, picked up from Shengyu Li's um, brilliant paper. Um, uh, he's a Harvard researcher um, uh, who wrote this paper on ethics and market design. Um, and I would highly encourage people to read that paper um, because this is an important um, takeaway, at least for me. Um, and to quickly conclude, um, what we talked about is non-discrimination in algorithmic uh, decision-making. But if you want to go to the full set of fair algorithmic decision-making, all that we talked about is today is learning non-discriminatory classification, but classification is just one simple um, machine learning um, or algorithmic decision-making task. Um, there are other types of algorithmic decision-making that use regression, set selection, um, ranking, and when you're talking about search uh, uh, search results on, on Google and other kinds of sites, matching, when you're talking about, um, about matching uh, consumers uh, with, with providers of goods and services on marketplaces like Amazon and, and, and Uber and other sorts of things. And then there is clustering, which is an example of unsupervised um, machine learning uh, task as well. Um, and it's worth thinking about how to apply non-discrimination principles, this, the, how to operationalize the fuzzy notions um, that we talked about in each of these contexts. Now, um, I can tell you, I can assure you that the precise operationalizations that we did make sense for classification, but they would have to be operationalized differently, um, sometimes in these different contexts. And finally, um, when I talked about non-discrimination, um, it's just one type of unfairness, and there are a variety of different fairness principles that are discussed qualitatively in moral philosophy, law, communication and media studies, and also quantitatively in, um, in, in areas like social welfare theory, social choice theory, and behavioral economics. So there is a very vast and exciting um, interdisciplinary um, field of research to be explored here where you can take these, uh, these principles, like the discrimination principle that I, that I took is just one example of this, and you could, and you could sit down and say, um, how do I operationalize this principle um, in, uh, in an algorithmic decision-making context? Uh, and there are lots of interesting um, ideas uh, to, that are um, open areas to be explored here. And with that, I will stop, and I will be happy to take any questions at this point.